Hello and welcome. My name's Karen O'Connor and this is Things That Make You Go Hmm. This is your podcast to help you make the most of the wisdom and experience that comes with getting that little bit older. Let's get right into it. Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. I'm here again with Dr. Ron Eker. Ron is an obstetrics and gynecologist and he's been practicing for 33 years and he specializes in menopause. Welcome again, Ron. It's so good to see you again. Thank you, Karen. It's a joy to be back with you. We just just to let you know, we've been talking for about 20 minutes off camera, so I thought we'd better press record and keep going. <laughs> I have the best job, I've got to say, because I get to meet people like you that I wouldn't meet normally. And it's just such a joy to have these connections across the world. Isn't it fun? I think it's that's part of the the beauty of this whole concept of podcast. I was just thinking earlier in the day when my first book came out, and this was probably... 10 or 12 years ago, I spent a lot of time doing radio interviews and they were largely, for your younger audience, radio is a thing that people used to turn on and listen at a particular time. And and you, you actually had to listen at the time the person was talking to hear what they were saying. But anyway, it, it, uh, it, it's so different now when you're doing things like podcasts because of the universality of it, first of all, and the democracy of it. I mean, virtually anyone can can do it. And unfortunately, that problem is that there's probably a lot of folks that don't do it well, but there's a lot of folks like yourself who really have a niche and really are not only meeting a need, but you're having a ball. You're having a blast doing it. And and I found that the format is so much more uh, conducive to getting information out there to just just having a good time. And, and I'm sure that it, because I'm a avid consumer of podcasts, I'm a runner and virtually every time I'm out training, I'm listening to a podcast. So it it, it is a medium that leads itself to to just uh, a tremendous amount of information, a tremendous amount of entertainment, and allows both the host and the guest, if that's the format, to, to just really enjoy themselves. And you don't see that in a lot of other media. And it, I, I love the, the ability of someone who has a calling and a message and a reason to try to help folks and provide information that has an outlet now and an outlet that doesn't cost millions of dollars or pounds or yen or anything else to initiate. You literally can begin uh, with a very minimal budget. And I think that's what one of the greatest beauties of, of this expansion of the internet and using tools that are available so I, I, I love what you're doing. I'm glad you're having fun because I'm having fun with you. And that that makes it even. And I'm sure folks listening are having fun. And if they're not just there's other podcasts, but I don't <laughs> think you should change. No, I, it's, it's in, I, I'm going to do a blatant plug here. I've just started or I've just released a podcasting academy because there is so much information out there. So if anybody's interested, I'm not going to go on about this, but if anybody's interested, go to speakupcollective.com and I'll put a link down the bottom. That was my blatant plug. <laughs> Thanks, no, I think, I know, that's fantastic. And it's wonderful. There are so many people out there that I truly believe have a message that others need to hear, whether it's based on their own experience. Uh, So oftentimes trials and tribulations, ups and downs that we've gone through personally really are very similar to what many others have experienced. And there's nothing like having shared experience to guide that empathy. But more importantly, then you can serve as a guide to help people to navigate whatever it is. That's the view that I take of menopause, for example, is I'm not the hero in this story. I'm the guide. The patient I'm working with is the hero. 
and they're faced like any hero's journey. They're faced with the obstacles and the problems that come along. It's you think the classic of, of the Star Wars, you know, where you've got uh, Luke Skywalker who has to save the the the, the planet and the and the solar system or whatever they call that thing there. He was the hero, but he was the challenged one, and and his guide was Yoda. So I like to feel like that I'm trying to play the Yoda to my patients and just be there as a guide and be there to help them walk through this process and and uh, allow them to to get that experience that comes from doing this for for 32 years, even though I'm a man. <laughs> It's important in what you're saying. And I hadn't considered it from this point of view. When I was, um, I've just got back from the UK to see my dad who had a heart attack. Now, my dad is an avid keep fit fanatic. He's very, very fit. And we were having a conversation because he had another heart episode a few years ago. But he's still doing the same kind of training that he's always done. And we had a few conversations and I said, well, you've got to, you've just got to adapt to new circumstances. It's not stop. It's just change what you're doing so it fits who you are now. And he said, well, how do I change? I've never changed before. I've never had to change. And then I thought, ah, isn't that interesting? Because as women, we go through all these different changes. We go puberty which boys go through too but then we have kids we get pregnant most of us let's just say we do we get pregnant and then we have children and that's a change and then we have more children which is another change and then we hit menopause and there's another change so it's kind of like we learn to adapt all the time but men don't necessarily have those same opportunities to learn how to adapt and adjust and reconfigure your lifestyle and your choices to fit where you're at right now so it's interesting so just coming from that perspective there is a, like, several questions in there coming from that perspective what is your vi- observation of the difference between men and women in that well there that you're right that leads to a whole variety of of questions and hopefully answers. And just going back to your original point about change, I think that is extremely important. Of course, what do we call the menopause? The change. So that's intrinsic in understanding what's going on, that one of the scariest things that people face throughout life, psychologists will tell us, is change. That's one of the most difficult adaptations that we can have psychosocially, whether it's a change of physical environment, a change of jobs, a change in relationships, a a change in the season of life. And certainly one of the most difficult things about menopause is there are differences and changes that are happening that are not necessarily understood And that creates another dynamic. You know, if you are in a relationship and it goes sour, you kind of understand the dynamics of why that's happening. If you're fired from a job or if you have an, an illness, you at least understand basically you can draw a line from point A to point B. But with something like menopause, oftentimes a woman will begin to experience symptoms, experience things going on due to this transition and not really have a good understanding as to why it's occurring. So not only is this change happening, but there's this question of why and is this normal and am I normal? And on that, the flip side, kind of leading into your question about the male perspective is those same questions are happening in the male's mind, but in a different context. When we think about something like menopause, there are so many tentacles that we have to consider. And I'll just give you an example. And none of this stuff happens in isolation. There, there, you can't just take this concept of hormone change and separate it into a box 
And then, okay, now we'll talk about hormone change. Now we'll talk about relationships. Now we'll talk about work. Now we'll talk about career. Now we'll talk about health. No, they're, they're all enmeshed. They're all intertwined. It, the analysis I, I like to use is the old, and I don't know if they even use these anymore, but the old mobiles that used to hang above a kid's crib with a giraffe and an elephant and a monkey. And you'd pull on one and inevitably the others would move in tandem with that. Well, that's what happens in our lives, whether it's our physical or emotional health. So a woman is, is having all these things going on in her system. And she has been very capable oftentimes of coping with these changes. As you mentioned, she's used to coping with these changes by default. She had to, to survive. And you're right. Men don't go through those same kind of changes. And we can talk about this concept of male menopause at some point if we want to, but they have adapted, but there's something about menopause that change that creates a heightened level of anxiety and some of it stems from the lack of understanding, the lack of knowledge, the lack of talking about it, where up until very recently, we didn't have podcasts like this. We didn't have even textbooks or other access to understanding. So the, the changes that were happening were confusing. But because this doesn't happen in isolation, and in most instances, many women, whether it's a spouse, a husband, a significant other, a brother, a father, there's some male figure that has some type of interaction with them during this time frame. So that I have found in my own practice is in a very important consideration that, that almost always comes up is this is not just about the woman. It's about the woman and her environment. And you can draw concentric circles that get larger and larger and larger. So that usually starts with the woman and her, her spouse or her significant other or uh, someone who's, who's intimately involved with her emotionally and physically and they're, they're connected. And then you extend that out to maybe the friends and the family. And then you extend that out to maybe workplace. And then you extend that out to even a greater group of fans. And all those folks in some way or another have some impact on her experience. Because again, it's not just about your lady parts. It's not just about the hormones. It's about your environment and your, your psychosocial well-being. All that impacts even things like hot flashes. So when you have, let's just say a, a husband that is working with or, or experiencing this change with his wife. Probably the biggest issue is just a lack of understanding from the male standpoint. We've already commented about how difficult sometimes it is for even the woman who it's happening to, to understand. Well, just imagine her spouse who doesn't even want to say the word vagina would just become absolutely apoplectic if you started talking about hormones. That's not a topic that, that, that they shy away from. They, uh, so that you can understand where this lack of information comes. And with that lack of information comes a lot of miscommunication. It comes a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, let's take one very common example, because I think it illustrates where a lot of times the couple has problems in this scenario. We all know that with menopause, one of the common symptoms is dryness in the, in the vaginal area, intimacy, pain with intimacy, pain with sex. And that can translate oftentimes into decreased libido. Your sex drive is driven off and your GPS can't find it. So we know that those things play a role. Well, if that's not discussed, if that's not talked about, the perception oftentimes on the partners, from the partner's perspective is, well, gee, I, there's something wrong in the relationship. She doesn't find me attractive. Maybe she's having an affair. Uh, maybe there's something going on that I'm not aware of. And, and, and it, you can just see how that can completely gestate into a, 
a, a cancer-like thought process that can really create a lot of problems in a relationship. So when it comes to menopause, and, and I promise I'm coming back around to try to answer that question at some point. <laughs> I, I know I, you, you, I, I, I go down these rabbit holes and sometimes you have to just pull me back by the ears. But coming back to that is that for a man, really step number one is out of love and compassion educate yourself a little bit about what's going on in your partner's life. And that can be done jointly. There's a lot of podcasts, for example, that can, that do address some of these issues specifically for men. I know when I wrote my books and in my online course on menopause, I've always included a specific chapter or a lesson or a session specifically targeting the significant other spouse, partner, whatever, whatever term is appropriate, because I know that's such an important part of the relationship. And we always start with that education. If I can get a husband to understand the very basics of what's going on in his partner's wife, his partner's life, all of a sudden, a lot of the fear and anxiety that comes from wondering why she's doing things differently begins to change. It starts with that education. Then it has to evolve into communication. That's the the second step is the partners have to sit down and, and very openly and honestly discuss what's going on, why you're reacting this way where you didn't a year ago. Why, why is, um, why is the mention of sex making you nauseous? Uh, you, you, I mean, literally to that granularity, have that kind of discussion. And I think that's the, the, the jumping off point. That's where everything really stems. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had a, a woman in my office and very quickly realized that a lot of the stress in her life and a lot of the friction is in her partner's reaction to the changes. I I had a lady just the other day who came in and her first statement to me was, my husband said, I need to come in and get fixed. So I knew right then we had a situation and it was, it was about a four alarm fire at that point. And we could have headed it prevented that a long time ago, but I knew at that point that my next step was to see if he would be willing to come in with her and us just sit down and have a very frank discussion so that that he's not afraid because that's where most of it stems from. That's what really drives a lot of the the man's confusion and anger and resentment and all the different emotions that come up. It's fear. It's mm. it's it's fear of things not being the way they were, assuming that things were good. But this change, I, I've, I've had several men tell me, well, is this the way it's going to be from now on? You know, they, they just they, it, it's just this fear of something different and they're not real happy with it, but they don't understand it. So it's, it's, that's, that's my approach. And it's an approach that I think has made a big difference in a lot of relationships and it removes a lot of the stress that is unfortunately falling on the shoulders of the woman. And this is a time when you've got plenty of stress as it is, and you you want your partner to be an empathetic ear, not a fix it. You know, when, 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 She's talking to you about menopause. It's not, okay, I'm going to tell you about my mood swings, but I don't want you to give me, okay, here's here's a list of what you got to do to fix this. That's not what they're looking for. They're not looking for, for the natural male uh, response is that, okay, well, that she's telling me this because she needs me to fix it. That's That's not what she's saying. She's saying, just listen to me. Just shut up and listen to me for a few minutes. 
that's that's going to be infinitely more value than the checkpoint, the checklist that uh, or sending them to the doctor and tell them that she needs to be fixed. (laughs) Very good points there, because the first one is, and I suppose they flow into each other. Um, The first one is if we don't understand and we don't know about menopause because you know that's women's business and I don't you know don't want to understand it then with anything that happens we're going to make it mean something about us this is you know it becomes all about the husband what like you said all of the fears come up and the problem is when the fears come up it then leads to that response of, well, I need to fix this. What do I need to do to fix this? So both the man and the woman would then default to their fight or flight responses almost. It, it becomes like a standoff, doesn't it? Yes, very much so. And then that that tends to snowball and it tends to spiral downward because, as we know, that that, that leads to other issues. You know, we we've all... All of us who've been in relationships know that it's never the fact that you didn't uh, lower the toilet seat. It's the fact that you've been disrespectful. It's it's not the little things. It's the big things that it's just the little things that serve as the triggers. And And so I think especially as we're dealing with menopause, that level of communication, that level of understanding can alleviate a lot of discomfort and alleviate a lot of uh, misperceptions that turn into problems that are greater than the, the initiators in many, in many instances. And it's, it's thank goodness that there are outlets now that if the, uh, if if the partner's willing and the way I approach it with women is I, I, I just let them know that, you know, we don't want you don't want to scare them off. You don't want to say, "Oh, my doctor said you have to come in with me for this session." Uh, you approach it from the standpoint of, I, I I know that things are happening. I'm trying to understand it. I think if if we can understand this together, then this can open up a whole new season for us. Make it a don't go into it as as a, a punitive or a negative thing. View it as you're doing this as an act of love and respect for me. And that's really, that's, that's how I try to approach getting folks into the office. If I'm going to take that tack, if I feel like that that's appropriate. What, okay. What information do you want to give to men about menopause? Because I've actually had quite a lot of guys reach out to me and say, my wife's going through menopause. I don't know how to deal with it. And all I can do is point them to the information that I've provided or to various professionals. But it's also that gives an understanding, but it doesn't give any action. And guys like action in general. That's a vast generalization, but men like to know what they need to do in order to. So there's an understanding, but there's also an action that's missing, too. Yeah, and and I think one drives the other. I think it's hard for for there to be any action steps unless you have a bit of an understanding. The very first thing I tell men, and I think it's important that men understand, is that this is a normal, natural transition. They are not broken. They are are not going crazy. They're not falling apart. They don't hate you. They're not going to... go off for a month long vacation and find themselves. You know, this, this is a normal natural transition. Here's why they're having some of these symptoms they may be having. And then I say, as I mentioned earlier, you just be quiet and listen. And though that's very difficult for a lot of men, it's like asking for directions. We just don't do that. It's just not in our DNA, but that's exactly what they need to do. And women in this time frame are looking for one thing and that's support that's empathy and now understanding a man is not going to be able to truly empathize because they're never going to experience that unless they've had prostate cancer and they go on 
hormones and then they come on estrogen and they come off estrogen and they have hot flashes. So that maybe that's a training ground I should do for some people is just give them estrogen for about a month, have them come off of it. And then I'll go, see, now you know what she's feeling. <laughs> but that may be a bit drastic. That, that might be taking it too far. But the, 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 I think the, the key word is just understanding and support. And there's probably, that's actually probably one of the easiest things that they can do. I mean, when you think about action, take an action, action list, they can get kind of complicated. Well, this is actually pretty easy is just love her, just understand her, listen to her, support her, empathize with her, uh, help her navigate uh, through, you know, help her figure out if her health plan is going to cover uh, this medicine or that medicine, or if she can go see this special. I mean, even those, if, if you need something to do, help her on the mechanics of her achieving the, the, uh, the, the types of things that are going to help her get better, uh, become the, the general contractor, if you will, to, to help the, the mechanics of what she needs to do, but don't expect, try, or hope to solve the problems yourselves. I think you, you nailed it before because you said there's nothing wrong and we treat menopause as there's something wrong. And I, and I think if you can get rid of that space from both parties, you know, because as women, we tend to go, oh, my God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> That's the first response. And it's also the significant other's response as well. But if you come from a space of there's nothing wrong, we just, um, you know, stuff's going to happen and we just got to deal with it. A lot of this is really above the neck. You know, we, we, we tend to think about uh, the physical manifestations, but there really is a lot of psychosocial interactions that go on. And one of the things, especially for men, that, that, that really makes it difficult is, is, is uh, they really don't understand the, this, this whole concept of something being different, something being something not being the way it was. We like that steady. We like that that complacency of of in that comfort in that area. And when when you know guys in his mid 40s, 50s, about the same age when a woman's going through this transition, you know, a lot of times they're in a good place in their career. They they have the family and friends. They're very comfortable and and who they are, then all of a sudden things change and they don't know why. And they don't know, is it something I did? Is it something that's going to, is this the person I'm going to live with for the next 30 years? Uh, you know, the very first statement in my first book was menopause is not a disease. And unfortunately, th there are several things that a man thinks about when, when, when a man thinks about menopause, he thinks age. We're getting older. That's the association he makes with it. And we live in a culture where age is uh, still has a very negative connotation. We're still a very youth oriented culture. Now we're getting better as all of us are getting older and you know, we this this in the U.S. We talk about the baby boom generation and about how there's this massive demographic of these folks entering into their 60s and and uh, and we're seeing a change in this concept. You know, 60 is the new 40, <laughs> and we're we're beginning to shift that. But still, there is this connotation associated with menopause in both men and women that it means I'm getting older. So I have to start facing the realities of that. And that's very challenging, especially to this age group of men who kind of grew up in uh, the 70s and in, in, in 80s when, you know, they were uh, thought that they were going to be young and virile forever. And then all of a sudden they, they get into their older age range and, so this concept of age is almost as challenging to men as it is to women, maybe even more so in some respects. 
So all that comes into play as you're dealing with this time frame, this transition. Again, we never can separate out the fact that menopause occurs at this time frame is full of potholes. Uh, we live in a generation in that time frame where kids are, are leaving. Oftentimes they're coming back in that age range. That creates a whole level of stress. Uh, you know, when you look at divorce rates and you look at single parenthood and all the things that this early 40s to early 50s potentially could happen, it, it's just it's rife for for stress and other factors that influence it. And then you throw in the concept of age and the association of menopause with aging, not necessarily age, but aging, then it it frightens a lot of men and women. So I think your point was extremely appropriate in that uh, you've got to you've got to play the head game. You've got to be sure that you begin to focus both men and women that this is not a, a necessarily a negative experience. You're going to live a third of your life in the menopause. Most women, if they're in good health, and that's not a time to give up. That's not a time to throw in the towel. That's a time to just celebrate and say, okay, this is my next season. And the same thing really applies to, to men. But what they're seeing is they're going, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have this lady throwing the covers off every night. And she, I'm going to wake up and roll over and drown in a pool of sweat next to her. This is what I've got to do for the next 30 years. So it, it all goes back to that understanding, but you can see the more we talk about the different factors, how complex this can be for any one individual. We're making broad statements about people in general because that's the only thing, only way we can have this discussion. But it really goes back to the idea that not only is it individualized for each woman, their experience, but it's also unique to each couple. And if you're talking about a married couple, that just like genetics and you get two people and now you have a real mixture of genes, that exponentially changes the dynamics and the interaction of the necessity of the individuality when it comes to the individuality of the woman. And then you look at it as the individuality of the couple. Uh, and that that creates a dynamic that is uh, is very unique to each scenario. It's interesting. There's a couple of things coming up for me as you're talking. One of them is about me personally. <laughs> I was deep in the throes of menopause and didn't really understand what was going on because I educated myself when I was post-menopausal. But if I'd known 10 years before that, it would have made a big difference. But my husband actually sat down and he wrote a list of pros and cons as to why we should stay together. I love that. That is so typical of male behavior. That is wonderful. Oh, I thought that was sweet. The pros came out, the pro that to staying together came out on top by a few. I, I was going to ask how that turned out. Yeah, so yeah. That's no, a, he said, that's a, and he said he had thing. to keep writing down the reasons for staying together but then it meshes with the other point because I was talking about two years ago I spoke to a friend of mine who's a counsellor who has he just remarried at the time he'd been married about two or three years and his partner was going through the menopause and his comment was I don't know who I'm going to wake up to in the morning <laughs> and that was one of my husband's points as well he said I'm he said, I'd look at you and I'd be like, okay, who am I dealing with? <laughs> Not quite sure what to say, what to yeah. do, what's going to work and make a day. And it's that uncertainty that John couldn't predict what, how yeah. I was going to, I couldn't predict how I was going to be, you know, so never mind John being able to do it. But that really threw him. I mean, I'm moody anyway, but he just had no clue. He'd say one thing one day and I was fine with it. And he'd say it the next day and I'd lose it. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a lady who had a very creative situation that she came up with to solve that problem. She had a little plaque by her bed 
And it was actually down at the foot of the bed. And it said on there, today I am a, and she could either turn it to princess or witch. <laughs> and she would, she would change that based on how she got up in the morning. And the minute her husband got up, he looked over there and he said, okay, at least I know who I'm dealing with today. And I thought, I love that. That, that's, that, that is a great way of doing it. It's just heads up. It's absolutely yeah. genius because then the guy knows. It's that uncertainty that John said he found so difficult to cope with. He come in from work and he's just like, okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe but, you ought to just put a, a, a red sock on the doorknob for the bad days and a white sock for the good days and and uh, that might make things a bit a bit more palatable. <laughs> it, it is that predictable. Guys do like certainty, don't they? They like yes. predictability and certainty. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like we have our routines. You know, we we know there's consistency and safety, and I think that's evolutionary. If if you think about our evolutionary development as the the million, hundreds of thousands of years that we existed as hunter gatherers the more stable and consistent our environment was, the more likely we were to survive. So I think that literally was built into our adaption as we evolved to, to favor that, that level, uh, that level of, of stability because there was less threats if we knew what to expect. Even if we knew the threats were there, it, we could deal with that. It was the it was the threats that we had not seen before. It's the challenges that we not had not faced that created the biggest source of anxiety. And you morph that into the 21st century, and and oftentimes the you know we're not running away from the mastodons anymore, but we are are dealing with uh, the, the the hot flashes and the mood changes. And those uh, can be just as challenging in many instances. I was just thinking that. I was getting the giggles because, you know, guys like certainty and, and these unusual challenges coming along and when a, your partner's going through menopause, you have no idea. <laughs> must be so uh, and, I, and I can tell you, maintaining a sense of humor is one of the secrets to survival. Uh, that when I when I see a couple that has navigated this effectively, inevitably they understand that laughing at themselves and each other is an incredible healthy tool. At the appropriate times, you laugh. At oh yeah, at the wrong time, yeah. and you're going to die. No, there's <laughs> there's also a lot of murder cases that have been solved by a husband inappropriately laughing at the wrong time. Yeah, I would, I, that that might actually be a, 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 a justifiable homicide defense. Is it? You know, yeah, he was just inappropriately laughing at me. <laughs> so what? What is? What would you most like to communicate to the guys about menopause? What is the most important thing to understand? I think the most important thing is to understand that for many scenarios, this is temporary. It's there's nothing wrong. It's not someone is broken that this is a normal, natural change, not without potential for symptoms that my job as a husband, a spouse, a significant other or someone in in her life is to to listen, to be supportive and to be communicative. That's one of the biggest. I think that's. Don't shut down. Don't withdraw. Don't shy away from having the discussion uh, because, believe me, she wants to. It, it's. I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here because this is coming up for me. My daughter, my youngest daughter, came home from work the other day and she works at the local cinema. And one of her friends that also works there was asked by she'd put something up, she suffers from polycystic ovary syndrome or something along those lines, maybe endometriosis, Kiwi's not sure. But she'd posted something on social media about it and her young male manager, only about 30, 
asked her to take it down because it was inappropriate because that's women's business and it's something yeah. that's not to be discussed. <laughs> Boy, I have not heard that in a while. That's pretty interesting. That that uh, they, I, I thought we were more woke than that. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that is a, that is a flashback from the 50s and 60s that that definitely is not your typical metrosexual male who 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 uh, has has come into the new century. I really do think that's probably a I would hope that that's a isolated response. I, I think that. We have become so much more uh, anesthetized against worrying about discussing those kind of issues. And, and I, I think we are, are much better at being able to talk about things like uh, anything related to hormone PCOS or endometriosis or, or PMS. You know, that's uh, the the. the the amount of discussion now of PMS and PMDD and all the different hormonal shifts, you know, for years that was so malign and so paternalistic the way that was approached, you know, you just pat somebody on her head and tell her, Oh, that's just your hormones, darling. And of course that was liable to get you shot very quickly, but it also was incredibly inappropriate. And, and I think we've, I think in large part society has graduated from that to understanding that you know these are medical issues that ought to be taken seriously and they're not you know these these uh, to me that's almost as objectionable as someone making a, a comment that if a woman is uh, aggressive or assertive that they would say oh it must be her time of the month you know that was always the the most uh, flagrant abuse of uh, that attitude that I, that I, and I, I, I'm hoping that maybe my age is showing here, but I'm hoping that that is no longer as much of an issue as it was even 20 or 30 years ago. I, I think one of the reasons I'm bringing it up is because that it, and that's just a really strong illustration of the attitude that there's something wrong with women when they're not behaving in a normal way, in the way that they would, that you'd expect them to from past history or whatever. Yeah, and that's the the other part of that is oftentimes it's it's the expectations of the person making the statement, and it's reflecting more on them and their attitudes than it truly is anything else. And I think those that th th those those types of comments are hopefully becoming far and few between. And it, I think people need to take that for for really what it is. And that's a a uh, really a, a, a problem on the part of the individual making the comment. Mm. Do you, is there a kind of male menopause? Is there like a mini menopause you go through? You know, there's there's been a lot of talk about that over the years, and largely it's been used to sell books, but there truly is nothing even remotely comparable to what happens with the switch in the in the hormone production and hormone regulation in a woman's body and in a man's. Probably the only thing that comes close to that is a drop in testosterone. Many people will you, the 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 buzzword now is low T and how that can cause things. And that's creating this male menopause. And that's just an absolute uh, misappropriation of that terminology. There's nothing even, even comparable to that. And uh, I, I think we need to just kind of get rid of that concept altogether. It's basically an excuse for men to, to uh, make room for their uh, uh, childhood behavior. <laughs> I love talking probably gonna get some, I'll probably get, get probably get some tweets on that one I'll tell you great comment I think that's probably is there anything else that you want to say I believe we've covered the gamut I don't know if I can top that 
that's a good point to end on. <laughs> People are going to remember that one. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, Ron. It's been absolutely brilliant talking to you again. Thank you, Karen. What's really interesting, I've got to say this, is that you are quite obviously really practiced at communicating because you get your point across really well. So thank you so much. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. (laughs) If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted and rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends, please. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with some great ideas that can make a difference in your everyday life. Until next time.